Hello everyone. Is that close enough? Who's measuring the sound? Um, so before I can delve into the... Uh, what's wrong, sir? Stay still, that will ground too much. Really? Oh, oh, this, okay. The camera. Before I delve into talking about the wildlife themselves locally, I want to give, give you more context for what's happening with wildlife in Australia and to really focus my talk more around the contextual issues about wildlife before the following speakers will talk about different species and the detail of what's happening there. So essentially I'll look at the status of wildlife, so the crisis that we're confronted with. It's not a happy series of presentations today. There is not a happy story to tell about wildlife. In fact, it's the, it's the reverse of that, sadly. And then to look quickly at what are the strategies we're using in Australia to try and save our wildlife species, and then using the Blue Mountains as a case study. And to flag with you some of the scientific and social and political issues that we are confronted with in trying to protect these species. So, in short, Australia ha has its claim, one of its claims to fame is it's got the highest record of biodiversity loss in the world and the highest per capita number of extinct and threatened species. And in fact, since European survive, uh, arrival, it's estimated that we've lost approximately 27 mammal and 23 bird species. And I say approximately because who's counting and a lot of these species disappear without us realising that they have, um, were even there to begin with because some of them are so cryptic. Um, this is a, a problem of technology that some of the words are, are we've transferred this from another format. Uh, in terms of the Blue Mountains fauna, there are, now I'm going to have to refer to it, the, the numbers are written down on here which are not showing up there. Um, there are 440 species of fauna in the Greater Blue Mountains, of which 23 are listed as declining and 65, threatens, uh, uh, 65 species are listed as threatened, and that's under the New South Wales Threatened Species Act. And of those 65 threatened species, we have 10 of them in, classified as endangered, more than 40 are vulnerable, and 10 are locally extinct. So what's causing these losses? This probably summarises the three key causes, one being habitat loss and land clearing since the Europeans came, um, introduced species, which is going to be the focus of Chris's talk at the end, and, oh, it's come up on mine, but not yours. Sorry about that. Um, and unmanaged fire, with emphasis on the word unmanaged. We know that fire is essential for biodiversity conservation, but if it's unmanaged, then it can actually be quite destructive to biodiversity if the, wild, if the fires get too hot and uncontrollable. So one of the key points I want to make is who's caring about this loss of species? Um, increasingly those of us involved in conservation and at the science end are realising that we've got to become better at communicating what's happening. And one could say that there's a fair degree of public apathy in Australia about the loss of our wildlife species. And again, that's quite likely to do with the fact that most of them are cryptic. What's out of sight is out of mind. People, it's a mostly urbanised population in Australia. People don't see the wildlife, not like the animals in Africa where, where they are very large, iconic species that most people are aware of. And this just gives you a list of some of the species in the Blue Mountains uh, which are either extinct, extinct on the mainland. Trevor in the box over here has an example of one of these animals that is, is extinct in the wild on the mainland, I should say. This is a spotted tail quoll, which is another species of quoll from what Trevor has, and this one's much larger. So we actually still do have those present in the Blue Mountains because they've been able to compete in the face of foxes and cats. This is a brush-tailed rock wallaby. There are two um, colonies of those in Wollamai National Park still, but under threat from foxes. Don't know what that furry animal is there. 
And this is, I believe, a little eastern quail. It could be a northern quail. So what chance have the microvertebrates and invertebrates got of attention to their plight? I had to put them up because today we really are focusing on the macrofauna and mammals in particular. And the Blue Mountains water skink and the giant dragonfly, which has the largest wingspan of a dragonfly in the world, it grows up to 12 centimetres. They are seriously threatened in the Blue Mountains. Now moving along to the strategies, what are we doing about them? Um, as you all know, one of the main strategies in Australia is protected conservation areas and globally. And they are both public and private. Trevor runs an example of a very private sanctuary, a small private sanctuary out near Lithgow. Uh, the Blue Mountains, of course, falls into the first category, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Um, conservation through sustainable use. That refers to ways of conserving wildlife outside of national parks through allowing uh, economic incentives to come into play in their use. I'm looking at the time here, I'm going to have to start jumping through this really quickly. Captive breeding and reintroductions. I won't steal Trevor Sunder on that, I think he's going to talk to you a bit about that. There's some questions here I've put up because they might come into the discussion at the end when we have a panel. Is there too much or too little regulation in terms of our wildlife protection? and the role of government. Is it up to the government to determine the future of our wildlife? Or is it more up to the broader public and having more civic engagement? Now, this graph just shows you over the last century, I'm focusing here now on protect, government protected areas, the number of uh, protected areas declared since 1911 through till 2011. So you can see it's been quite a exponential growth in protected areas and in Australia 11% of land is actually held within protected areas and there being more than 9,000 of those. Uh, there was a question I'd put up which, ha which isn't showing but it said is this strategy being successful? We'll come back to that question after you've heard what the other speakers have got to say but uh, it's, there we are, there's the question. No, it's short. There is the strategy working. Uh, it's it's really not having much success at all in saving these species, and the reasons for that will be uncovered. Now, this is a map of the Blue Mountains Water Heritage Area. In case some of you weren't familiar, if Sydney is about here, Katoomba is up along here, and so you can see the million hectares. Uh, pretty much goes from Wollongong up to Newcastle. And I wanted to just quickly put up for you the two key reasons for why we have World Heritage status in the Blue Mountains, which has been in place for 13, 13 years. Uh, one key reason is its representation of eucalypt species. There's over 100 species of eucalypts in the Blue Mountains. And it's also this extraordinary living laboratory for the study of evolution and its important habitats for the conservation of biodiversity and threatened species. Which leads me on to now have a quick look at one of the key threats to those animals, which is introduced species. There's about nine main mammal uh, species of feral animals in the mountains. Foxes, pigs, cats, goats, horses, cattle, Rabbits. What's the ninth one, Chris? Deer. Deer. Yes. What's that? Deer donkeys. Donkeys. And what happens with management of these species is that there are so many, there are conflicting values. You know, a lot of us here, our value is conserving uh, biodiversity and native species. But for all the farmers who have properties around the border, they have very different interests in controlling feral animals. Uh, they're protecting livestock, which can come up with some, some conflicting management objectives, which we're going to unpack a bit for you today. There's uh, so much politics involved because of that. And this question about the role of science, um, what we find, with, especially with managing horses, who cares about the science? Nobody wants to see a horse shot and you can, you can go black and blue in the face trying to tell people that, but, 
but they're causing all this erosion and they're trampling all the vegetation and if we have thousands of horses here, how can we have a national park? We now have 15,000 wild horses in Kosciuszko National Park. We have about 60 in the Blue Mountains and there's now a complete stalemate in control of those horses. Are you going to talk about it a little bit, Chris? Yeah. The reason I'm touching on frail animals, not to steal Chris's thunder, but because I am a freewheeling academic who can say what I like, whereas Chris is actually employed by the government and has to toe the party line to some extent. But um, there, there is no uh, more shooting of these horses in the park because the government won't sign off on it. An extraordinary amount of taxpayer money has been spent trapping and mustering the horses out of the park. And the management committee has now decided that they can't justify more investment in it so have requested to be able to go in and ground shoot the remaining horses. But the top executives and the politicians are so scared of the public backlash that now the horses are being allowed to build up again. We've already now re-established the number of horses that were there before the trapping and mustering effort. And there's a longer history to why it's quite so political now is because of a um, helicopter cull of uh, 600 odd horses over a decade ago in northern New South Wales in a national park up there, which has meant that there was a ban put on aer aerial culling of horses, and it has also scared anybody off doing ground shooting on top of that. So the other, the other area of uh, wildlife control in the Blue Mountains that is particularly contentious is dingoes, which are more commonly referred to as wild dogs, and here the issue of terminology comes up quite often in the media, you won't hear them talking about dingo control, you'll hear wild dog control, which includes dingoes and hybrids which have bred with feral dogs. And again, because of the conflicting objectives about controlling the dingoes to protect livestock, and yet there is an increasing argument from the ecological perspective that as top order predators, they have an important role in the ecosystem. Before we had the Tasmanian tiger, today we have the dingo. And if we didn't have the dingo out there, we have foxes and cats. And foxes and cats are the most destructive predators for our native mammals, whereas there's increasing evidence that dingoes actually protect the smaller native mammals because they have had thousands of years to evolve with them and find more of a balance. So I put up the photograph of the wolves in Yellowstone chasing elk as an example of how it is an analogous situation whereby you have, when you have more dingoes in Australia, you have less kangaroos, you have more biomass on the ground. And that slide refers to that point that I was just making before about do dingoes assist survival of Australia's small native mammals through predation of foxes and cats? And that is something that we're, the, through the Institute, we're actually now engaged in some research to try and build up more of our knowledge base to understand what the actual role of dingoes is in the ecosystem. So to close off, this is a picture of one of Trevor's little black eastern quolls. What, what then should we be doing about it? I think one of the main issues is communication and public awareness. Another is, I've called it adaptive governance and legislation, but that's really about leadership. Who in our society is out there taking leadership in terms of our wildlife conservation? And how can we do it better? And thirdly, building up our knowledge base, in particular getting more science so we can actually have our decisions about wildlife being better informed on a level of evidence. So thank you very much.